right, we are getting ready to go here. Um, ah, there we are. And I wonder if people will be showing up. Will you be showing up soon? Soon. There's a little delay. 20 seconds. Oh, somebody has thumbs up. Great. <sighs> we'll see how we're doing here. Oh, people are showing up. Wonderful. Oh, boy. Hi, Cindy, Terry Lynn, Jean, Cheryl. Welcome. We'll wait a couple more seconds here for the Facebook notifications to go on through, and then we will get started. Um, this is not your regularly regularly scheduled uh well it is regularly scheduled it's just not your regular regularly scheduled host hi steve uh today we are doing things um i'm pastor aaron finker if you don't know if you're new i'm kind of pitch hitting for pastor borkhart and today we are doing things um that pastor borkhart can't do and um that's not staying on task no not that um, it's not, um, you know, taking infrequent breaks because of a dog. No, we're not doing that. No, we are going to be talking. This is the bearded Bible hour. So we will be talking about all things bearded, which Pastor Borkhart can't do. And I guess he can talk about the Bible. He does that pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> yes, um, we are in Genesis chapter seven. That's where we are today. Um, and we will probably make it at least through seven, probably through eight. That's as much as I've prepared. Um, singing. Oh, I forgot about singing. Um, well, if we, we did singing, I I don't know. Hmm. We'll see what comes to mind. The um... So, without much further ado, um, why don't we just start diving into the text? Um, where is that? There we go. All right. Okay, and Yahweh, the Lord, uh, Jesus, uh, said to Noah, Go, uh, you, and all your house into the ark, uh, because I see uh, that you are righteous um, before this generation. Um, so uh, here Noah is righteous, and why is he righteous? This this echoes back to the beginning of chapter six when all this begins uh, with the flood, that everyone's evil. Everyone. There's someone there's not one person who's not evil. Um that's how this that's how it sets it up. And uh, except Noah. But why? That Noah is described as righteous. But that's actually the second thing about Noah that's, that we're told. First, we're told everyone's evil. And then we are told, uh, but Noah found favor or mercy. That's the word used. So the Lord is merciful to Noah. And then suddenly, um, because of the Lord being merciful to Noah, then Noah is righteous. And... Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. For the Lord sees that he's righteous. Why? Because Noah is righteous by faith. Um, he is a preacher of righteousness. Um, that's mm, Second Peter. Um, he preaches the Lord's word to, to call people to repentance um, and faith in Yahweh, the, the, the living Lord. Um, the only people who believe it are his family. Um, no one else really believes it. Um, and you see that lots of the patriarchs before him, the faithful ones, um, well, they, they are either like Enoch taken away or um, they die. Um, but Noah is righteous by faith. The Lord is merciful to him. And as we see um, in a couple chapters, you know, after the flood, um, one people aren't better off and Noah certainly isn't better off after the flood. It's not like um, this is the Lord's improvement plan for the world. 
um, that he's going to he's going to start over, set things right, get people on the right path, and then everything's going to be, you know, roses after that. That's not what we're going to see. So Noah is righteous uh, in all this generation. He's the one who actually um, trusts in the Lord, he and his family. So what does he say? Um, from all the, the clean uh, animals, uh, take with you seven. Seven boys and seven girls. Seven male, uh, seven men and seven women. It's kind of an odd thing that it says. Um, and from uh, the animals which are not clean, uh, take two, um, a boy, a male, and its mate. That's kind of what it, what it says. Um, so um, here we see, uh, yeah, we always remember two by two um, pairs of animals. Uh, but when it comes to clean animals, then there are seven pairs, not just two pairs, or one pair. Um, so seven pairs. So um, something like sheep, there are 14 sheep taken, or 14 cows, or 14 goats, uh, for example. That's, that's what's going on. And then also, uh, verse 3, uh, from the birds of the heaven, take seven, seven male and seven female, uh, to keep alive. Uh, seed uh, upon the face of all the earth. Um, so seven birds as well. Uh, so seven chickens, seven doves, uh, seven birds. Um, and we'll see why. We'll get there at the end of chapter seven. But this is setting up um, what's coming. Um, and why is Noah to take all these things uh, on the ark? Because while well, we're at seven, we're seven days out from the uh, the cataclysm, seven days out from destruction. Um, for here it is in verse four: seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. And every living thing uh, that I've made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did. Um, according to all that Yahweh, the Lord, commanded him. Jesus commanded him. Um, so here again, it is it is Jesus. And again, uh, with Pastor Borkhart, I'm not, don't send letters in. I mean, yes, it's Jesus before he has the name Jesus, but it's the Son of God. Um, there's a reason that in John chapter 1, he's called the Word. And he's the Word because he bears um, the Word of God to the world. That's part of why the Son is called the, the Word. And so if there's a Word of God being delivered, um, it is actually the Son uh, of God delivering that message from the Father. And so that's, that, that's here at this point too. So the Son of God, um, the, uh, oh, give me a second here. Let's turn that off. There we go. That's awkward. It's like the... Uh, didn't forgot to silence my phone in the movie theater. Whoops. Um, so the Son of God is the one bearing this message. And which sort of makes the Son the judge of the world. Uh, which is what we confess in the Creed. That he is, um, he will come again, again in glory to judge both the living and the dead. Um, because Jesus says in John that he um, is given judgment of the world. And he's sort of executing that here with Noah. Go into the ark, take, take the animals with you. Okay. Again, um, like Pastor Borkhart, uh, this is interactive. So if you've got a question or something you'd like me to, to kind of talk about with the text, uh, certainly put that in. There's there's a little bit of a delay. It's about, oh, 45 seconds or so. So if you post your question, it'll take me a little bit to get it, but I'll get it and then I'll answer it. Um so Noah did everything the Lord had commanded him, verse 5. Um, and Noah was a, a son, of, well, he was 600 years old, um, when the, the flood waters were upon the earth. And Noah went, uh, and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark. Uh from before the face of the waters of the flood. So it's like 
this is a very um hebrew is a very visual language so it's like the waters are coming for you and they're going to come get you and they're they're fleeing from the face of the waters um verse uh eight uh from ooh, the clean animals and uh Let's see here, verse 8. Of the clean animals and of the animals that are not clean and of the birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God commanded Noah. Um, so here we see... Um, so Noah does take the animals, but here we start seeing that there is sort of a divine aspect to this, that the Lord himself is delivering to Noah what he should do. We often miss this. Um, <laughs> we like to always think like, so Noah is some sort of agent off on his own. God's given him a task. And so Noah does it faithfully because he's a good person. And so he's saved. Um, but really, it's it's that Noah is given a job and then the Lord does uh, all his work, which is pretty much everything, to have Noah do that job. Um, so he tells him build a boat, but he gives him all the directions. Build it out of this wood. Build it this big, this many decks, um, with the door here, the window there. All all of the steps the Lord gives to Noah. Um, here, that way I'm not so small. Um, so he, you know, build the ark this way, and then the same thing with the animals. So he says, take all these animals, which seems like a daunting task. Like, how is that even possible? Um, and sure, we don't know what kinds means fully. Um, we'll get there in a little bit that um, the animals come on according to their kinds. Um, but still, you have to think, that's a lot of animals anyway. Um, so even if, you know, um, if we want to say like, you know, he takes on some sort of canine, uh, I mean, okay, but maybe he is taking on you know, coyotes and wolves, or, you know, what is it? It's just lots of animals. How is that possible? But here the text talks about how Noah take these animals. That's what he's commanded. And then we're told of all those things, they went into the ark as God had commanded Noah. And it's this this passive language. Well, why did they go in? Um, it doesn't say here that Noah took them in, even though he's commanded to. They just went in. Because it's the Lord himself who's working um, to bring it all about. He moves and directs the animals to listen to Noah. Um, whatever that looks like. I mean, I don't know. All I know is that the text here is that God, Noah is commanded and then they just went in. They just sort of went in two by two. Um, and living in farm country, um, the... Uh, the cows always get out, and it's always interesting to you know hear about farmers having trouble with their cattle or to to get them to move in a certain way in a certain direction. Um, and sometimes it's easier than others. Some cows are easier than others. Um, so the idea that Noah does this with all the animals is sort of mind blowing. Um, so not so much like herding cats. No, not so much like herding cats. That the Lord is here working. Um, with Noah, in and through Noah, the Lord is working, and he is working for Noah as well. Um, that's all that's going on here. Um, in verse ch in chapter 7, verse 9. So, again, right here, the, uh, the animals, two by two, male and female, went into the ark as God had commanded Noah. So it's like the Lord did it for Noah. Um... And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. Okay. Uh, okay. So here we get um, just the, the, the facts, the history. Um, in 600, the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. 
and rain fell on the, upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And there was rain over upon the earth. Yeah, forty days, forty nights. Um, so this is a very specific time. Um, it it doesn't say like at some point in Noah's life. It doesn't ring, um, like a like a fairy tale. It's very specific time wise. It's written as if it's history because it is like it happened because um, Pastor Bor Borkhart pointed this out that um, Jesus believes that this is true. Jesus treats this as if it's true. And Jesus, the one who rose from the dead, anchors us to this history. And um, we get that even in the style of its writing. So Noah is, um, you know, Noah is 600 and it's a the second month of that year, 17th day of the month. And we'll get that at the end, too. It's a nice bookend to the story, um, a very narrow and specific time frame. Rain, water, rain, water came from the sky. Uh, that is Sandra's question. Um, so, okay, this is right. So before this point, there really isn't rain. Um, we're told that there's a mist that goes up. Um, and so this would sort of be the first time that there, at least according to the, the, the text, that there's rain, um, which makes it, <laughs> in a lot of ways, this would be happening in, well, the world is coming to an end. That's literally the, the feeling that you would get. Well, if, if there's really hasn't been rain, what would the people think? Would they be confused or, you know, puzzled? Um, really, I think it, it, it would be that they would be terrified. Um, think about the things that Jesus describes for the end of the world. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, um, the, the powers of the heavens being shaken. That sounds scary. It's terrifying. And if you're to, um, if we're to think about, um, the plagues in Egypt, those are also, uh, terrifying. And so this water from the sky would have been terrifying. They would have thought the world was ending because in a sense it was. The Lord was ending the world because of it, it, its sin. Judgment was there. Um, but this flood again is, is not so much about the destruction, which is true. It's more about the Lord holding fast to his promises to save the world. He can't destroy everybody because he made a promise in Genesis 3. Um, so the world is ending, but the Lord saves from the destruction of the world. Why is there so much detail showing an accurately recorded historical account? Um, yes, Cindy, I think that's part of it. Um, and it just reads like, it doesn't read like a, like a fairy tale. Like, you know, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't find this, you know, in like the, the stories I read to my kids, you know, like the princess and the pea. It's not like, um, that doesn't begin like, Hey, um, in the first, uh, in the, the King was 20 or the Prince was 20 years old. And on the, in February 22nd, uh, there was a big rainstorm and at about, Oh, 1130 PM the uh, princess showed up. There's none of that in, in, a, in a fantastical story. Um, but it's all written here um, just matter-of-factly as, as if it happened because it, it, it did. Um, and we believe it happened because Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, but even with that, we're not, um, we don't want to deny the fact that the text is written in such a way to express that this is and historical account. All right. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there is the breath of life. And those 
that entered male and female of all flesh uh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Okay. So here everything goes into the ark as God commanded Noah. And here again, it's just like this passive language. Um, so who's doing the action? And always in the scriptures, if there's this passive language, which we don't, I guess, normally do in English, but there's no sort of actor or agent, it's kind of to be understood that it's the Lord himself doing it. Um, but the big thing here that we want to focus on, and this is the refrain uh, throughout all the remainder of this, it's probably been in chapter 6, but I don't completely remember, Um is that it's all focused on Noah. It's how do you relate to Noah? Are you are you with Noah? Are you with Noah on the boat? Or are you not with Noah on the boat? That's how you're saved. You're tied together with Noah. Um, so they went into the ark with Noah. Um, and so it's all about Noah. And the Lord shut not them, but him in. Um, and so there again is it's Noah. Everything's tied to Noah. He is uh, the savior of the world at this point. That's Noah. He's the one who brings comfort, salvation to the world. And when you're tied to him, um, you are saved. And if you're not, well, then you're not on the boat. You're outside the boat. And the, the judgment um, hits you. You're not carried safely through the waters. You're not saved um, from the, the destruction. You are the, the waters are death to you. They are not life to you if you're not tied to the name of Noah. Um, and that's so that that here, this this really does point us to baptism. So are you tied to Christ or are you are you not? Are you in Christ or are you not? Um, are you part of his body, the church, or are you not? Um, that's all at play here in the relationship between Noah and his family and the animals and who's on the ark and who's not. Um, that, that's why the this is continually brought up again and again and again. Steve has a question. What about the fish? Um, with a flood, there's no um, reason to worry about the fish. The fish will will kind of be okay on their own. Um, now, what do you do um, with um, with uh, what do you do with you know saltwater fish and freshwater fish? Um, well, again, this isn't um, a science book about how fish are going to work that out, but there have been some thoughts um, from creation scientists who talk about how. The waters back then would have been kind of brackish, that is like semi-salty, and that at least for the for a time that um, all the various fish could have survived in that sort of environment. Um, but that that's kind of getting too much into the science aspect of it. Um, but just kind of the the basic kind of explanation that we're told is that well, it's the waters are destroying the earth, so if you live in waters, you're going to be all right. Um, let's see uh, and the Lord shut him in here we are as the Lord acting so why is Noah kept safe and secure in the ark it's not because he built a good boat because he was faithful um, because he did everything right he did do everything right I mean God told him to do stuff and he did it God worked it out for him to do it um, but the big thing is is the Lord shut him in the Lord kept him safe. The Lord saved him, used Noah as the savior of the world. Um, literally, not just um, not just people, but animals. Okay. Now let's start reading about what does this flood do? So they're in the boat, and what's going on outside the boat? Well, the flood, um, and the flood was... Uh, hold on here. Let me do this real quick. That's not what I want. Oh, I don't remember how to do what I want. Doesn't matter. Is it? Here we are. Hold up here. 
one else died. Never mind. Um, the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters um, oh, were mighty. Um, they were mighty. They were um, victorious. And increased exceedingly very much upon the earth. So, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. Um, and the waters were mighty, victorious, very, very much upon the earth. And um, all the high mountains were covered, which are under all the heavens. Um, so here, the waters are being described as like an army. Um, which then sort of echoes language from Revelation, why... Um, the end of the, the world is sort of described as um, the destruction of, you know, the Lord sends out his angels, sort of his army is sent out. The, the waters here serve as the Lord's army uh, to destroy the earth. That's the word the word used. It's the, the Hebrew word is like for the mighty men of valor. If you read your Old Testament, you see that word. It's the, it's the same word that they're using. The waters... Um, were 15 uh, prevailed mightily uh, above the mountains covering them 15 cubits um so that's what the waters did and what did the waters do to all the other stuff well here we go um and all flesh that moves upon the earth perishes perished birds livestock beasts all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth Oh, yeah, and all people, all the, the Adam, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Um, so at this point, what I'd like to try us to, to do here is... We'll go into chapter 8 here in just a second. But what I want us to get a feel for is um, trying to, to not consider the end of the story yet. So the Lord has made a promise. And that we know the Lord is true to his promises. So if he's promised to save, he's going to save. And he's going to do it the way he promised. Um, but here in these verses... We want to see how the destruction of the, the world is just complete. And really, if we're to consider looking at the judgment of God, who then can be saved? The judgment of God is complete. Nothing is sort of, no stone is left unturned when it comes to the Lord's judgment. The water goes everywhere. The judgment goes everywhere. It's victorious everywhere. Like a conquering army, the waters just keep coming, keep rising. There's nothing that you can do. No no wall, no levee, no nothing will stop it except the ark. And the ark only because the Lord shut them in. All flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the, the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him on the ark. And the waters um, conquered over the earth 
150 days. Is Noah even going to make it? Is he? Is the Lord really going to be true to his word? And this story would have been related from, from Noah himself. And, that, and, when, and from that perspective, we start seeing the, the, the concern that even we, we can have as Christians when it comes to the judgment of God. That when the end of the world comes, who will be saved? Uh, when the Son of when Jesus says, "When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth?" That that the judgment is such. Well, am I even going to make it? I mean, Noah thinking about what's going on outside the boat. Everything's dead. Everyone's dead. There's nothing. There's nothing left. It's all gone. Just me and my family and these animals in a boat. And it's 150 days. What's going to happen? Is the Lord going to be true to his promises? Because what, what you can see, what we experience, it doesn't seem so. It doesn't seem that way at all. So what's going to happen? I'll do it one more time. All flesh died. Everything died. He blotted out everything on the face of the ground. Noah was left, but the waters prevailed on the earth a hundred and fifty days. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And here's the mercy of God. God does remember. He remembers Noah. He remembers the Savior. He has regard to his anointed one, the one he's set apart to save the world. And here Noah is a picture of Jesus. So when we're experiencing in a world that seems to be undergoing judgment at this point, Jesus said it would happen as we're getting closer to the, the last day, these things will you know, increase on the earth, but... What does God remember? He remembers the Savior. The Father remembers his Son who died and rose for you. And who's ever tied with Jesus, well, they'll be saved. You'll be saved. I'll be saved too. Just like it was with Noah. The Lord remembered Noah. Yeah, his promise. But it's really, he's remembering Noah. Remembering the Savior. And he's remembering then everyone who's with him who's thrown their lot in with Noah, the, um, that the Lord brought to Noah. Everyone tied to Noah. His sons, his, his wife, the wives of his sons, all who were tied to Noah, who trusted Noah, his preaching. It's all about Noah, the Savior, the Comforter. God remembers him, just like he remembers Jesus. And because he remembers Jesus, he remembers you too. You bear the name of Jesus. Um... Just as um, Noah's sons, they all bore his name. They're his sons. Hem, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are Noah's sons. So it's all about being tied to Noah, just like it's all about you being tied to Jesus. Jesus tying himself to you. And so what does God do in remembering Noah? Well, he made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. They, 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 they stopped up. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. The waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. So here again, we get um, a time marker, very specific time, seventh month, 17th day of the month. It's almost as if <laughs> you, you'd think about, um, like in the movies or whatever, um, you get a, a prisoner um, who marks on the, on the wall of like when, when, you know, how many days has he been in there? And you almost get the feeling like Noah's done the same thing. Like on the inside of the ark, you'd find like carved in tallies of like, oh, it's been this long. How many months has it been? Seventh month, 17th day of the month. Oh, there we are on the, mountain, on the mountains of Ararat. 
and then there's still time time markers going on and the waters continue to abate until the 10th month in the 10th well when in the 10th month i mean that would be sort of something like that you know in the fall time the fairies went out and did things um but no more specific than that 10th month when oh yeah on the first day of the month the tops of the mountains were seen and at the end of 40 days noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven it went to and fro until the waters dried up from the earth and then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the ground um but the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned him him to the ark um so yeah so he sends out the birds um so the raven doesn't come back but this dove does and here again um and it's good that um the ESV is is a little bit more literal at this point because again it it echoes the Hebrew in such a way that again we're seeing this move then he Noah sent forth a dove from him everything again is tied to where's Noah and what's he doing um and why does he do this to see if the waters have dried up but the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned to him to the ark she didn't just come back to the ark she came back to noah because that's he's the one where there's safety yeah it's the boat but again we've sort of seen this theological move that it's about the dude who's made the boat who's got the name um so it's about um it's about him for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth so he put out his hand and took her and brought her in into the ark with him he awaited another seven days and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark and the dove came back to him in the evening and behold in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive olive leaf so no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove and she did not return to him anymore so so this would um, be the the end of noah's salvation time he's no longer the one in, in whom to find safety um here we are big time marker again in the 601st year in the first month the the first day of the month the waters were dried from the earth and noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold the face of the ground was dry in the second month on the 27th day of the month the earth had dried out then god said to noah so here um noah is waiting for a word from the lord he doesn't do anything so he built the ark the lord gave him a word build the ark this way so he did it that way um the word of the lord came to him get into the ark goes in the ark so now um things are dry um dry enough you know the, the the dove doesn't come back to him so he opens things up so that there's sort of fresh air you can see things going on and he looks out and it's dry but yet no word from the lord um and that doesn't take place until the 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 next month so for total they've been on the ark for over a year now um and then we get a word from the lord Brian, a wizard is never late. They always arrive exactly when they mean to. Um, go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out um, with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So yeah, everybody get off the boat. It's time to be done. No more, no need for the, for the ark anymore. Um, 601 years referred to no. Yes. So yes, the, the time markers are based on um, not just the month, um, like the time of the year, but also uh, Noah's age. So here again, it's not, huh, yet again, we're always tied to, to Noah. It's not, um, 
this ever many years after the creation, it's always tied to Noah. How old is Noah when this happened? Well, I was 600 years old. And in this month, this day, this happened. And then I was 600 when I got on. I was a 601 when I got off. Um, oh, five minutes. I at least got to do... Uh, It'll be fruitful and multiply. That's what he tells the animals. Um, he's not telling this to Noah and his sons quite yet. Um, he's talking about let all the animals go so that they can be fruitful and multiply. Um, and so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. So here... Um, things are different now. So they came on in pairs and they're leaving by families. Um, so here, uh, yeah, so there, there's there's bears growing out with their cubs, for example, or wolves with their litter. You know, that sort of, that's the image we're to have here. That they went onto the ark, a male and a female, and come off um, as a family. But what's going on here? Uh, let's keep rolling in the last, oh, Boy, so much to cover in four minutes. Um, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord... Um, so here, this would be why there are seven clean animals t taken. Because Noah's going to do a sacrifice. And that's sort of the thing, right? We know that from uh, Cain and Abel, that there are sacrifices. And so, you know, you take two sheep on... And maybe three sheep come off. Um, if you're doing sacrifices, you're going to run out of sheep real quick. Um, so this is a, a, a protective measure um, that the Lord's not only doing a first article gift here, may, protecting his first article gifts of, um, of food and drink, um, clothing and shoes, all sorts of things you can make from an animal, uh, but he's also protecting second and third article gifts. So the sacrifices point forward to the preaching of the Son, um, and at these sacrifices there would be preaching that the Spirit would work. So here the Lord is setting up um, and protecting not just first article gifts so that we have sheep today, which, you know, take that for what it's worth, but so that there can be sacrifices. That's what the Lord's trying to set up here. This pleasing aroma is language from Leviticus. This, I mean, if you want to talk about a refrain in Leviticus, yeah, there's lots of blood and guts, but it's it's really this pleasing aroma language that this is what the sacrifices are for, um, pointing forward to the sacrifice of the Son, who is the true sacrifice. Uh, Twenty one, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, "I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth." Neither, neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I've done while the earth remains seed time and harvest cold and heat summer and winter day and night shall not cease. Okay. Um, and here we see nothing has changed. Not a thing. If we were to go back to, um, I won't, if we're going we're to go back here to um, Genesis chapter 6. Um, that is um, Genesis 6 verse 5. Here, I pulled it up. Genesis 6 verse 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's how man was before the fall. That's everyone, like I said, Noah included, but um, but Noah found favor. So mercy from the Lord uh, for Noah. And then we've got, uh, neither, let's see, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. It's the same. It's the same. People are the same. Noah's the same. This is not, the Lord's not looking for an improvement program for people. The only improvement program is to save them because they ain't going to fix themselves. Noah is not going to fix the problem. Yes, he's a, he's a picture, an image of the Savior, but Noah as a person, not in his office as Savior, um, 
not as office of ark builder and preacher and all these things. Noah as an individual. Um, not any better than anybody else. You, me, we're not going to get better. The Lord can give us all the commands and all the help that he wants. But unless he takes the initiative to actually save us, we're all doomed. If he just left it up to Noah and was like, hey, a flood's coming. Figure it out, Noah. Um, or he said, build a boat this way. Well, what wood should I use? What's going to... the? Or how am I supposed to get all the animals? Or maybe, you know what? I don't particularly like. Um, I'm not going to get the creeping things. I really don't want to do the spiders. Noah decided that as an individual or something. Um, no, it's all the Lord. And he appoints Noah to this office, an office of ark builder, an office of preacher, an office of savior, to save um, those who are with him in the boat, to save his those who listen, his sons, his wife, his son's wives, to save the animals. That's what it's all about. And so he, you need a Jesus. That's the Lord's improvement program, is to just save you, to forgive you your sins and not expect you or demand you to get over your sins or to get over the evil intentions of your heart. Can you? I mean, we can't even get over our evil deeds. Can you get over the evil that you want to do but you don't? Think about that. Get good motives. Get good intentions, always. Yeah, yeah that's not going to happen. So the Lord here um, has this pleasing aroma. And so there is this sacrifice coming that will, um, that will save everyone. Because that's why the Lord saves Noah. We don't want to forget that. The Lord saves Noah because he made a promise in Genesis 3 to send a Savior. And you can't send a Savior um, who's going to be born if there's no people. And oh, by the way, you can't save people if there's no people left. So the Lord has a promise and he's going to keep that promise. And that's why there's a Noah. That's why there's this office of ark builder and preacher. And finally, um, the earth is going to keep on going. Um, whatever um, the seasons are going to keep going. Um, I don't want to get off on a, on a tangent here about other things. Um, but I'd, I'd rather not get hung up on 22. I'd rather get hung up on 21. So we'll just sort of let, unless somebody has a question about 22, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so here we are. We're going to get more information on Noah in the next chapter. More word of God. Um, more word of God for Noah and more word of God through Noah. Um, but then we'll also get the account of, well, there's always a story to, you know, an account um, to let you know that things aren't rosy, right? So Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. Things aren't good. Well, you got Cain and Abel. There's proof positive. And well, Noah and his vineyard, it's proof positive that, that Noah's no better. Um, and as an aside, um, now that I'm almost five minutes over, um, this is the other thing that sets the scriptures apart, is that just because it records it doesn't mean it's a good thing. That this book shows the sins of, of the people, the patriarchs, the people we look up to. It shows their sins. It shows Noah's sins, Cain's sins, Adam's sins. All of those sins are laid bare to show that the Lord isn't about improvement projects, but saving sinners. He saves Noah, appointed him to his office to save other sinners so that we would see an image of Jesus who saves us from our sins. And because of Jesus, the Lord won't curse us. He won't curse us for the intents of our heart, even though they're evil all the time, evil from our youth when we're young to when we're old. There's Jesus. That's what it's all about. And with that, five minutes over, I thank you for your time. And come back tomorrow, same time, same place. Um, won't have me. You'll have me next Monday, but you won't have me tomorrow. Tomorrow will be Pastor Borkhart. With that, thank you. Have a good day.